This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cootie, and Huskers Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. Welcome back into, yes, another episode of the Sideline Slice Presented by Valentino's Pizza. Jeremiah Searles is back in the flesh. You're alive, buddy. I am. Like I've told you guys before, you know, <laughs> January through April, I disappear off the face of the earth. I've been on the road. I think I added up 34 days since the start of the year. So it's been an incredibly busy time for me, but it was good to be back around the building today, back in, seeing friendly faces, new faces. It's just good to be back. And in studio at that. Yes, like, and in studio. I mean, a big time I, I today. I get to sit in the, the VIP Greg's seat, so it's always good <laughs> to sit in the king's seat every now and then. Oh, well, I mean, pro day. It, it's why you're back in the building. Mm -hmm. What'd you think overall? Yeah, you know, I thought it was a very good showing by everyone. You know, good scout numbers showed up here. I think I saw probably about 30 of the 32 teams looked like they showed up. You know, certain guys had good days. I don't think anyone had necessarily a bad day, you know, so that's always what you want to see. You know, as a pro day guy, didn't go to the combine, or even if you did go to the combine, you're just always about your last at bat in front of these scouts physically before draft day. So you prepare for two and a half months, three months, whatever it may be, for a three hour workout. And it's funny, you talk to the guys afterwards and they're just like, it's over. It's like, yeah. yes, it's over. Congratulations. Now go be a football player again. It's not fun really no. right like to get ready for this day and it's not much football it is uh, a lot of just training to it's run the, fast and jump far it's the underwear olympics that's what i refer to it as it is the underwear olympics right it's how can you play without pads on and you know i think sometimes guys and you know agents front offices whatever can put a little too much stock into some of these things but you know we were talking about a little bit off air you know for pro day guys a lot of it is too is these numbers that you put up and if they're really good numbers and we'll get into oliver martin's like all that does is make guys go back and re-watch your tape. It brings you to the front of the line of a bunch of guys they have to watch, right? That's what you want to do as a pro day guy that's a non-combine guy. And we had some guys do that today, which is really good for those guys, and then it hopefully gives them a shot come draft day. It seems like that happens a lot where guys that don't get to the combine and, and make a name for themselves with, with some of the numbers that jump off the page to you. And today it was Oliver, Oliver Martin, which I'm not surprised. I mean, I did a feature on him last year. Dude was like a state champion swimmer that didn't really train because he was doing football and baseball. He just jumped in the pool and was like really fast. Like he's a freak athlete and not surprised that he tests well, but 44440, I think he 11 2 broad jump. Yep. I mean, he was uh, really impressive today. Yeah, and I think he had a 42 inch vertical too. I mean, so overall the explosiveness was really on show, you know, and so the question always becomes for a guy like that, like the scout, right, goes, okay, what happened? Why wasn't his production where it is or whatever? But you can always think like, I can't coach that. I can't coach speed. I can't coach athleticism. Like a guy like that, scouts will love and down on the lower end of the draft or to the free agents and be like, let's get this guy in the building and see what he can do with NFL coaching, NFL quarterbacks, and those type of things and see if maybe we can create and mold a player that can be a four core teamer for us and then carve himself out a role as the fourth, fifth receiver on the depth chart. And Garrett Nelson, another guy that didn't get an invite to the Combine. How'd you feel? Surprisingly. Like, really? I really thought he was going to get an invite to the Combine. You know, I thought he was a guy that, for me, you looked across Nebraska's defense and you're like, who's the heartbeat? Who's the heart and soul of that defense? It was really easy. It's 44. You know, he's a longtime starter in the Big Ten, got a ton of production through his years here. You know, I think the hardest thing and the thing Garrett's going to have to fight is he's a tweener. You know, we talked about it last year with JoJo Doman, right? But he got a great fit. He got a great fit, right? All you need is a foot in the door. You just need one team to fall in love with you and one team to say, I like that guy. I like him as a football player, whether he's an on-the-ball linebacker, off-the-ball linebacker, whatever it may be. He's a good football player. I want him on our team, and he has all the intangibles on the other side of that. So I do think he'll have a shot come draft day. I asked him what's next. He's like, I'm going to go get a burger. Yeah. <laughs> you got, these guys have been so dialed in on their diets. Um, you know, one thing we do as an agency is we put every all of our guys through an MRT test. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you basically, I'm going to sound like a nerd, you take blood and you test it against 100 different, 170 different food peptides for what your body reacts to. Not allergies, so like for me, like mine was broccoli and asparagus, healthy foods, right? Things I used to eat all the time, but my body had a hard time breaking those down. Huh. So I wasn't recovering well, I wasn't doing all these things. So we do all our athletes, um, our center, John Michael Smith from Minnesota was cheese and he loved pizza, <laughs> loved it, right? Classic O-line move. And so when he got done after pro day, we took him out and he's like, I want a pizza right now. <laughs> and so we took him to Broadway pizza, you know, but like these dudes have been so dialed in every single day. Like this is such a 
big check box for them in the process. And now, really, it's just back to becoming a football player. Who's a team potentially that Garrett Nelson is a good fit for, do you think? I think any team. You know, I really do think any team is going to get a four core special teams guy right off the rip. You know, mm -hmm. I think Garrett Nelson is going to be a chance to be an undrafted guy that makes a 53 because of the heart and the intensity and how hard he plays and who he is as a person, you know, and that's what you need as a young player is to carve yourself out a role on special teams first so that you can make the 53 and then you start working your way into how you're going to fit into the defensive scheme. Well, Trey Palmer did run at the combine and he got quite a lot of buzz. He was the fastest wide receiver there. I don't think to any surprise to anybody around here knew he was going to go run really fast, a really fast 40. But you were there at the combine. What's it like when a guy puts up a number like that and you start hearing all the chatter about, oh, this guy just ran this? Yeah, I mean, he was the buzz of the combine, you know, and as a as an agent, you always want your guy to be the buzz as the week winds down, you know. So when you're the fastest guy at the combine, you're going to absolutely get a ton of people to look at you differently, right? Like, because everyone's looking for that guy that can take the back end off of defense, right? You're talking about a guy like Christian Watson last year from North Dakota State, gets drafted the Packers, was hurt at the beginning of the year, comes back at the end of the year, and their offense is completely different, right? So I think Trey Palmer running what he did is going to really break guys' rise on the draft board. I think he's probably a day three pick. Anywhere in day three, you know, because when you hit those day three receivers, it really just becomes what teams need. Do they want a burner? Do they want a big body guy? Like, and everything in between. But when you run 4 four three three or whatever it was, like, you're going to get a team that comes up and drafts you. What kind of impact do you expect Trey Palmer to make in the NFL? You know, I'll be curious to see. You know, he's not very big stature wise you know but if you look at like Samori Ture also wasn't very big and he caught touchdowns from Aaron Rodgers this year you know so I think a lot of it is going to be how that speed can translate which we saw in Memorial Stadium here it can translate to getting open you know so if he can get himself open create separation and become comfortable with a quarterback in the NFL I can see him being a day one roster guy and being dressed and contributing his wide receiver four um, on rotational things in there and then working his way up to try and be wide receiver three. Potentially a punt returner too, right? Correct, correct. Always, always the need for returners, right? If you can be four three three, get back there and return, then have that. But I'll tell you this: punt returner is a terrifying position. Yeah, I would. I would never in a million years want that job. That'd be the last position. You're I'd staring wonder. up at the sky as this thing's going crazy, and there is ten people running down the field that just want to murder your teeth. So, and not to mention know. sometimes when it's cold or snowy or rainy, and you better not drop that thing. Hard pass. <laughs> Hard pass on being a punt returner. You know, one thing about pro day too is you see a lot of former players. Players come back. You were in the building. Austin Allen was there. Uh, Cam Jurgens was mm -hmm. back today. Uh, why is that? Why do former players want to come back and be here on this day? Yeah, you know, it's just one of those things that you remember the stress and the rigors of what this day meant to you. And when you can see guys, and I can remember seeing former players that came back for mine. Marcel Jones comes to mind. You know, Mike Caputo, guys that I played with. You know, it's just kind of a comfortability thing. You're like, oh, my, my guys are back, right? Like my guys that were here and grinded with me and supported me, and they're now been in the league and done it like just a, someone to talk to that's a different face right that's someone new that now has some experience to lean on and then from our side you know you just want to go support those guys the best way you can whether it's a, a fist bump or a do great job today or just anything because the stress that these kids are under right now is just incredibly it's so much stress and so anything you can do to make comfortable and also it's fun to come back and talk to the guys that have been in for you and be like how fast did this go like how does it mm -hmm. seem this has been a year ago since you were out here running your 40 Austin and he he looks at you like dude it just it goes so quickly and even for me, I can't believe my pro day was a decade ago. <laughs> like a decade ago, I was out there doing that. And like, it's just mind blowing how fast things truly go. I think Husker fans, there, there's still a lot of interest. Adrian Martinez is mm -hmm. you're, you guys are representing him. What do you expect from him? I mean, I know there was a lot of buzz when he got drafted in the uh, USFL. USFL. So where do you expect him to maybe go? Yeah, you know, he's uh, he's surprisingly be one of our guys that's gotten a ton of buzz here mm -hmm. as of late. You know, I think people look at him. That was kind of his what he did at Nebraska, and there's this body of work, and then there's this separate body of work of what he was at Kansas State, and then there's this other separate of what he was in the All-Star Game circuit. So he was a guy that went to the Hula Bowl, played really well, got invited to the NFLPA Bowl, played really well, and now he's got some 30 visits that he's been setting up to go. He's going to see some other Zoom calls. You know, he's going to test extremely well, yeah. which to the surprise of no one listening to this, you know, he's a crazy good athlete. You know, and 
with the expanded practice squads, you know, and neither the ability to bring guys up from practice squad a few times, he's a guy that you can put a special package in, like a Taysom Hill type of package, where you bring him up one week and you run five or six plays, and the next week you don't have him down, you don't have him up, but guess what? That team that you're playing that week has to prepare for that package, right? So he's the kind of guy that I really do think can carve himself out as a quarterback three role of a maybe quarterback four practice squad guy and just continue to get better. He's just such a good athlete. I think he'll really find a good spot in the league. How much, too, just seeing guys like what Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, some of these mobile quarterbacks have done in the NFL help a guy like Adrian Martinez? It's huge. It's huge. And, and I mean, the, the whole NFL in general is shifting away from the statue passing pocket quarterback. You know, you got the, the special talents of the Joe Burrows, the Josh Allen, but those guys can still move, mm -hmm. right? The Tom Brady's, the Peyton Manning's of the day of stand back there, one, two, three, deliver the ball, just aren't really a thing anymore because the college game has expanded so much, you know? So those guys are really paving the ways to, for guys like Adrian Martinez, you know, for guys like the Cunningham from Louisville this year, you know, guys that are movers and can run around and do special things. You know, it's really exciting because those guys are going to now get a shot. And, you know, all you can ask for in this league in the NFL is to get a shot. Right. So, you know, I think if Adrian can just get a shot and go show his leadership skills, all those things, you know, he's going to have the question marks as every player does. You know, but I'm just excited for him and how much he's grown just in the last year. Family traditions mean great food. With treasured Italian family recipes passed down for generations, Valentino's has become Nebraska's classic Italian tradition for 65 years. Well, one thing about you being back around and in the building, you got a chance to chat with Matt Rule, some of the staff here. What what have been your takeaways? I love Coach Rule. I do. He's he's been so great to former players of like, hey, this is the house you guys built. You're always welcome around, which is just fantastic. And you know, Scott was like that too. You know, and so it's always good to not have a huge disconnect from the previous staff on that front. But you know, I've just loved the way he's approached everything from his first press conference to he was at the Team Jack Gala when I got to see him there to we go to the same barber. I mean, he talked about being out in the community and being a part of Lincoln, and he's walked that walk. And, you know, anytime you have a new coach that says those things, you know, you want to buy in, you want to believe it, but he's actually doing all those things. And I tell people all the time, he's won everything but September now. You know, like that's the next box check is what is September going to look like, which is what you're graded on in this business is your production in the win-loss column. But from what he's done of talking with guys and seeing some guys of what they've the changes they've made just in the weight room, you know, seeing guys that I saw at the end of last year to what their bodies look like now is night and day. And you talk about, man, there's still four months till training camp gets rocking and rolling. So from the strength staff to the way he's running the culture, I am very excited for September. Yeah, I did want to hit a little bit more on the culture just because we've heard it over and over. We've heard players talk about it. I mean, the standard is high. There's mm -hmm. high expectations. He expects it from players, staff all around in that program. When you walk in those doors, I mean, it's not easy and you're going to grind and you're going to work hard and, and you're going to do things right. How important is that? to establish that now for it's, what you do in September. It's the most important. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to come in as a new coach and you set a bar and you go, this is the bar. Anything below this bar is not tolerated. And when you can set that culture and you have then examples of that culture of the right way and the wrong way, you can see that there is no gray area. You know, I truly believe that as a college coach, you have to start preparing these guys for life in the NFL and also life outside of the, out of these walls. And the way you do that is by shaping them into young men, not just young players, but young men. And everything I've heard from Coach Rule and everything I've heard from the people around him is that's his number one priority is to help shape these guys into good young men that when they leave this place, whatever profession they move into, whether it be football or in the professional world, like they have a great understanding of accountability, leadership, respect, all those things that are you can be taught and brought up to. And, you know, as a, as a parent now, and I can remember my dad when we came here with Coach Pellini, like when I left here, my, my dad looked at me and goes, that's someone I'd turn my son over to. And I really do think that's what Coach Roll wants to be and having the experience of being in college, being in the NFL, back in college, he's seen it all. So he knows what it truly takes. All right, let's talk offensive line. I can't believe it's taken us this long to get to the offensive line. But uh, Coach Riola is back. I talked to Ethan Piper after day one. I mean, just what is that? do for an offensive line they've had so many different coaches but to get a guy back everybody else is working with new coaches but for the offensive line in particular how big is that to actually have some some consistency there and be able to go into year number two with an offensive line coach it's huge it's absolutely huge because i mean you talk about developing offensive line like everyone has different techniques everyone has different skills of how they want the offensive line to do certain things so when you have a coach that you can now have gone through an entire spring ball an entire uh, season and now you're going back into the spring ball with them like you're just perfecting those techniques and those skills more and more and more and so when you can have the consistency of that you can take huge strides as a player 
right? Like you see it happen at every level, college and NFL, when you're mingling coaches and mingling positions as a player, your development is just stunted. And so I'm really excited to see the development of some of these guys, you know, it hurts my heart to be at a pro day and not have a Nebraska offensive lineman out there doing it. But that's where we need to get back to is the feeder pipeline of what this place was for offensive linemen, where every year you're talking about guys that get in drafted or guys that are going to be undrafted, but you knew were going to play in the league because they were smart, tough, dependable, and they had proper technique. And I think with Coach Rayola and Coach Rule and what their staff wants to do with their offensive linemen, you build offensive linemen from the inside out. You draft, you bring them in, you draft them. You bring them in, you can tell them in draft mode. <laughs> you bring these players in as young, two, three star, four star, whatever they are and you bring them in you develop them from inside the building offensive line we've talked about in this pod all the time is not a plug and play from a transfer portal type of position it's a growth place position from freshman sophomore senior year you grow so much and when you have the same coach growing with you in that that's when you can see the big jumps in the position not just from a whole but from an individual standpoint too would you say that offensive line is the hardest position to change position coaches them and quarterbacks. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. say O-line and quarterbacks. Yep. O-line and quarterbacks are definitely the two because you spend an entire year trying to do something the way that your coach wants them to do it. And then all of a sudden you have a new coach comes in. It's like, hey, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. Now you're doing it like this. And you're literally starting from the ground up. Right? Some coaches like a vertical set or 45 degree set or we can get into the ins and outs of whatever it may be. But when you're changing that over and over again, your body doesn't get into a rhythm that just becomes natural. Right? Offensive line play should become so natural to you that you no longer are thinking about your technique. It's just muscle memory. And now you can start thinking about all the other crazy stuff that's going on in front of you. But when you have a new coach every year and you're thinking about, okay, I got to do this technique right, you can play slower. You know, when you think you stink is a use that people use all the time in the coaching world. You want to have these guys that have been drilled over and over and over again with their technique that they don't even think about it. It's as, it's as simple as pass sitting backwards, as simple as walking to the toilet every morning, right? It's just a <laughs> habit, right? And so when you have coaches that you can do that consistently with year in and year out, you just see growth from the other sides of their ability to recognize defense, their abilities to help a guys, young guys along the line, their ability to see blitzes and all that stuff just becomes so much more easier for them to start grasping. You know, with... Um Nuri is back mm -hmm. out on the field. Teddy coming back, which Teddy had a big offseason. You know, they, they track points and competitions, and whoever is the leading point getter. Teddy was a co-leader co of the getting points uh, throughout the offseason, which was big. So he's a great offseason off performer for this. I mean, just – and we saw this group – get better as the year went along. I mean, what's, what's your, I guess, perspective, expectations for this group here in spring ball? Yeah, you know, I expect them to take a big jump. You know, I, I would like to come out of spring ball with about seven guys that I think are game ready come September. You know, you want to have your starting five, but you got to build depth, right? You bring in Scott from Arizona State. You bring him in as your middle guy because that is a hole that was going to need to be filled. Trent Hickson was gone. Cam Jurgens is gone. It's like that's a position that's very important, right? But you start talking about, okay, who are my tackles, right? You can't win in this league without championship tackles. You look at Michigan, right? Michigan's got Ryan Hayes who's going to go be a NFL draft pick at tackle. You look at Ohio State, they got two offensive tackles. Like, you win because you have championship tackles. So you start talking about Teddy and you talk about Ben Hart and you talk about Turner and you talk about some positional flexibility guys out there I'd like to come out of spring ball with two solid tackles and then about five guys in the middle that you think can contribute and help you win in a long a lot of ways what does it do though when you I mean you were on part of O-line groups that did this where you, you start building where you've got a lot of guys that have played a lot of football together mm -hmm. so you look at all, a lot of these guys are going into year three and four that they've lined up together and, and played a lot beside each other. Yeah, that's huge, right? You talk about the communication aspect of how do you play fast. Well, you have communication that doesn't have to be echoed five times around, right? You have a guy where you know it's a certain combination block. You kind of just look at each other and nod like, so you got it, right? And you move on. But also then it becomes with when you have the same five, you can start really developing a leadership style in that room. Because if you have five guys that have played a lot of football together, they set the bar in that room, right? We talk about Coach Rule setting the bar for the program, and then you have to have in each every room a bar and a standard set that there is no gray area. It's right or it's wrong. And so when you have guys that have played a lot of football and understand what it takes to play 12 weeks in this league in college, you then set the bar and you bring everyone else along with you. And if you can't cut it, then hey, until you can, you sit back there, right? And then it drives everyone else in the room to be better and better. So when you have guys that have played a lot of football, it's their responsibility, not just Coach Rayola's, it's their responsibility to bring the young guys with them so that you can have a more cohesive group. Other than offensive line, what are the big things you are intrigued about this spring? Fedoni. 
I want to see Fedoni. Would you, Matt Rule said he's kind of mad at him because he's going to limit him a little bit. And Fedoni, Good. I think, <laughs> yeah, right? So I talked to him a couple weeks ago, and he acted like he was ready to go 100%. He was going to be let loose. But I, somewhere along the line, that conversation happened. He's going to be held back a little bit. Got to keep him healthy because he's got to make it to the fall. So um, I, Coach Rule said that Fedoni's mad at him because he – of course, he's a competitor and wants to be out there right now. I'm all right with that. You know, <laughs> you talk about two years ago, Austin Allen, Big Ten tight end of the year. Travis Volk, like this year, combine invite, going to go play in the NFL. Tight end is a monster position for any team. And you talk about a guy that had a ton of, of hype coming in and just has caught the injury bug. Like, let's just get him to the fall and see what he can do because I think he's going to be a huge weapon for this offense. And when you have a quarterback that can be really comfortable with a big body tight end, I mean, it's a security blanket. And so, you know, I really want to see what Fedoni can do coming into the fall. So it makes me happy that he's going to be limited because I'm excited for that young man. You represent Austin. We've heard a lot. I've talked to Travis a lot. It sounds like they tra – uh Fedoni has done some special things in practice. Yeah, I mean, two years ago, Austin told me, like, dude, watch out for this guy. Huh. Like, he's going to be special. And, you know, I'm just, I'm really excited um, for him. But also, you know, it kind of starts to make me wonder, like, you, you saw Chancellor Brewington out there pro day today. Like, who else is going to step up? Like, you got to have two tight ends because you want to run 12 personnel and have two of those guys out on the field that are strong players for you, you know. So that's a position group that I'll be watching pretty closely to see kind of who's emerging as tight end one, tight end two. I mean, if you can come out of the spring with three tight ends, minus Fedoni that you feel comfortable with and you throw Fedoni you got four meaningful guys that's a huge plus for this offense all right what about on the defensive side of the ball D-line obviously um you know you bring Ty Robinson back who I think's probably the best D-lineman in the room so far but you know you lose some key pieces last year you know Colton Feast is no longer there anymore you got to see big jumps from Nash you know these are these are guys in the positions that I mean, rules no no dummy to it. The fronts win you games, whether it's Big Ten, whether it's the Big 12, whatever. You know, he had some really good players in Baylor up front on both the offensive and defensive side of the ball when he was there. He had some good players in Carolina on both sides of the ball. He drafted Iki Ngakwe as the number sixth overall pick as a left tackle last year. So he understands that the trenches win you games. So watching the D-line and seeing kind of what that scheme looks like, newer scheme, newer wrinkles, how that goes will be another thing. But who's going to be playing next to Ty Robinson? Who's going to be making sure those double teams aren't climbing up to Henrich and, and Luke Reimer and those guys to allow them to do their thing. So that's another position group. And then obviously we lost so much in the back end last year too, kind of seeing who's going to be that back end piece as well. So people are going to want me to ask you about the 3-3-4 defense and your take on that. And, and did you ever play up against a 3-3-4? Honestly, no, I never did. You know, it's one of those things that the Big 12 is known for forever of being a 3-3-4. And, you know, for me, it's going to be something different as I'm going to look at it. It's going to take my brain a little bit to kind of look through the ins and outs of it. But I do know that it does create a lot of preparation nightmares for offensive schemes because you have guys running all over the place and different type body types all over the place and you know you can create some really unique blitz packages out of it but I do know you have to have two inside guys that are dogs in order to run this defense and I think with our linebacking core what they are I think we have the guys to do it um, even though it still pains my heart Ernest oh man but you know it's one of those things that you got to have some dogs inside that can run all over and, and cover up for some mistakes. When you have blitzings that get caught, they can still run things down, you know. So I'm really excited just to kind of watch overall what our philosophy from a defensive side of the ball. Are we going to be ultra aggressive? Is it going to be more of that shell defense, keep everything in front of you? Because you can do it all from the 3-3. Like you can do everything in between. So that'll be something I'll just keep my eye on as we watch the spring game and as we move closer to the fall of kind of the – aggressiveness philosophy that this team's going to have. I think for me it's more so about, um, you know, less about, okay, three, three, four. But to me, just talking with Tony White and some of the players, it's more just being able to be versatile and the matchups, whoever you're playing, and being able to plug and play guys. And I think that's what they're looking for out of players that come in is guys that can do a lot of different things. Absolutely. It's like, yeah, it's like, that's what I mean. Like, you're going to have a D-line. Can you have a D-lineman that can put his hand in the dirt and rush the pass, but also drop and go cover the hook curl, right? Do you have a guy that can play – uh, deep safety, but when you need him to walk him into the box and be a thumper in there to stop the run, you know, so you're absolutely right. The versatility for the 3-3 is enormous because you have playing guys playing 
tons of different positions that aren't necessarily their natural position, but you still have to get productivity out of them. I, I think for me too, defensive line is one that I'm looking, about, looking at too, because on the you got a lot of guys in the secondary that are back: Miles Farmer, uh, Quentin, um, and then some of those guys that are coming back there. And then linebacker Luke Reimer says he's finally this is the healthiest he's ever felt, and I think they brought in some guys that they're really excited about. But it's who are you going to play up front, which is so key and so critical. You got to other than Ty Robinson, who else are you going to plug in there beside him? Yeah, and also like who's going to be the new most Emotional leader of this defense, right? Like you had Garrett Nelson out there who's been the emotional leader for the last two or three years. Like who's stepping up to that plate? Who is it going to be? You know, some guys lead in different styles, but everyone needs that emotional leader on the defensive side that's going to be there to to have the bring the energy when things aren't going well or to keep guys even keeled when things are going great. You know, I'm really interested. I'm not sure who that's going to be this year. You know, and I'm not sure we're going to know coming out of spring ball either. Those are yeah. kind of things you see when the bullets, real bullets start flying in the fall of who kind of steps up to the plate for that. All right. Well, um, what's, I guess, for, you know, when you go into a spring, and it's a little bit different when you have a new staff and they're trying to establish their own, but what, when you get through these 15 practices, where do you want to be as a football team? What are you hoping to get accomplished here? Yeah, you know, it, with a new staff specifically, the one thing you want to make sure is just operation, right? Operation is so important that you lay the foundation of not just from a football side, but like, hey, this is what the practice schedule looks like. This is what I'm expecting of you every day from this period, this period, and this period. And then by the end of spring ball, you should have that down to where when you go into fall camp, that's a non, that's no questions anymore. Now you're really focused on the X's and O's, but also just installing your base offense, base defense here, the stuff that you're going to line up and run right now, but you're also going to run in November, right? Those type of plays that are non-negotiables, I don't care what they line up in, this is our base stuff. You want to have a really good grasp on that so that when you show up to training camp, you can have the grasp on the base stuff, but now you can start bringing in the, the odds and ends, the sprinkles, the gadgets, the this against this look, against that look. But for a new staff going into spring ball, you really just want to have all the base stuff covered and the operations of what practice and what you're expected every single day. And then from a player's aspect, you know, I tell these guys that I'm recruiting guys right now all the time, I tell all these guys, go into spring ball with one thing you want to get better at. Just one, you know, don't have eight different things. Like I want to get my hands, my feet, like just have one. And if you can stay focused on that one thing every single day for those 15 practices, you'll be amazed when you come out on the other side of like, man, I've mastered that now on to the next thing. One player that you're most intrigued about, excited to watch develop through spring ball? Gabe Urban. Yeah. You know, I think, I think he's a guy that, for me, you saw a lot of specialness for him as a young player. He was hampered by the knee injury. But he's a guy that obviously is getting a lot of love around here. But, you know, that running back position is going to be really important in this Coach Rule offense. You know, he's a guy that I would love to see pull himself away from this class of running backs and showing that he's the guy. He's huge, by the way. Good. He's put in the work in Good. the weight room there leading up to now. So You need it, man. It's a physical position. It's a, it's a position that takes a very physical toll on you, and you can be a tone setter from that position. So I'm really excited for him. A.J. Allen looks good, too. Our, our guy. Boy, our, our guy. guy. They called that last year. <laughs> those two guys, I think those two guys can be a special running back room. Talking back to years of the Rex Burkheads, Amir Abdullahs, and having that one-two hit. Like, if those two guys can figure it out, I'll be, I'll be on the lookout for that. All right, any day now, it's going to be a Searles family of five. Yes, my wife is fit to be tied. She is, she is ready to get this little baby out of her. So baby boy number three will be here any day now, and we'll have three under four and just an absolute madhouse over at the Searles household. Verman is excited, right? He can't wait. Verman can't wait. My daughter has no idea what's happening. But, yeah, he can't wait. He can, his, his name's Graham, so we'll have little baby Graham. So Oliver will correct you. He'll be like, oh, what's your He'll be like, it's baby Graham. I'm like, oh, Graham. He goes, no, no. <laughs> Baby Graham. So, Baby Graham will be here any day now. Well, next time, maybe a podcast, you will be able to talk about that new baby in the Searles household. Absolutely. It's so good to be back. Golly, is it football season yet? Right. We well, got a little bit, but glad you're back in the building, mm. too. And good to see you. And uh, we'll have another episode probably at the end of spring ball. We'll, we'll revisit and break down everything we've learned after the spring game. So, um, Finally, people have been asking for you. Where you been? So you are back. I'm back. I'm All right. Well, for Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sideline Slice presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Go Big Red. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska, has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years.